Um, our reading this morning is from 1 Corinthians 14, 1 to 19, 26 to 33, and 39 to 40. Follow the way of love and eagerly desire gifts of the Spirit, especially prophecy. For anyone who speaks in a tongue does not speak to people, but to God. Indeed, no one understands them. They utter mysteries by the Spirit. But the one who prophesies speaks to people for their strengthening, encouraging, and comfort. Anyone who speaks in a tongue edifies themselves, but the one who prophesies edifies the church. I would like every one of you to speak in tongues, but I'd rather have you prophesy. The one who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues, unless someone interprets so that the church may be edified. Now, brothers and sisters, if I come to you and speak in tongues, what good will I be to you unless I bring you some revelation or knowledge or prophecy or word of instruction? Even in the case of lifeless things that make sounds, such as the pipe or harp, how will anyone know what tune is being played unless there is a distinction in the notes? Again, if the trumpet does not sound a clear call, who will get ready for battle? So it is with you. Unless you speak intelligible words with your tongue, how will anyone know what you are saying? You will just be speaking into the air. Undoubtedly, there are all sorts of languages in the world, yet none of them is, is without meaning. If then I do not grasp the meaning of what someone is saying, I am a foreigner to the speaker, and the speaker is a foreigner to me. So it is with you. Since you are eager for gifts of the Spirit, try to excel in those that build up the church. For this reason, the one who speaks in a tongue should pray that they may interpret what they say. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. So what shall I do? I will pray with my spirit, but I will also pray with my understanding. I will sing with my spirit, but I will also sing with my understanding. Otherwise, when you are praising God in the spirit, how can someone else who is now put in the position of an inquirer say amen to your thanksgiving, since they do not know what you are saying? You are giving thanks well enough, but no one else is ever edified. I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you, but in the church, I would rather speak five intelligible words to instruct others than 10,000 words in a tongue. From verse 26. What then shall we say, brothers and sisters? When you come together, each of you has a hymn or a word of instruction, a revelation, a tongue or an interpretation. Everything must be done so that the church may be built up. If anyone speaks in a tongue, two, or at the most three, should speak, one at a time, and someone must interpret. If there is no interpreter, the speaker should keep quiet in the church and speak to himself and to God. Two or three prophets should speak, and the others should weigh carefully what is said. And if a revelation comes to someone who is sitting down, the first speaker should stop. For you can all prophecy in turn so that everyone may be instructed and encouraged. The spirits of prophets are subject to the control of prophets. For God is not a God of disorder, but of peace, as in all the congregations of the Lord's people. And from verse 39, Therefore, my brothers and sisters, be eager to prophecy and do not forbid speaking in tongues but everything should be done in a fitting and orderly way. Amen. Thanks so much, guys, and good morning, everyone. It's lovely to see you. Well done for making it to church on the long weekend. And if you're feeling jealous of those who got away, we'll just pray for you right now. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you so much for this opportunity to be together 
in your house, and I pray that as we look at this topic this morning of speaking in tongues and more broadly the gifts of the Spirit that you pour out upon the church. Holy Spirit, I thank you that the primary role that you play within the life of the church is to reveal Jesus to us. And Lord Jesus, I thank you that your heart is to show us the love of the Father. And in this way, we are brought into the life, the dynamic life of the Trinity. And I pray this morning, Lord, that we would hear your word and that we would be open to receiving what you want to do in our midst and that we would keep growing into all things in Christ and allow you, Holy Spirit, the space and the room in our community to do what you need to do in order to lead us to fullness of life and maturity in Jesus. That is what you were given to do, to lead us into all truth, to reveal the teaching of Jesus, to make it alive in us, to teach us the law of the Lord and write it on our hearts. And I pray that this morning as we think about this particular gift of tongues, that our hearts would be open, that our minds would be ready to receive, and that, Lord, we would desire all that you want for your church. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, well, welcome to One. My name is Tim Horman. For those of you who don't know me, I'm the senior minister here. Uh, unfortunately, I wasn't able to speak last week, but thank you so much to Jess, who stepped in. <laughs> Jess, you did, wherever you are, you did an amazing job. Oh, there you are. Um, thank you so much for that. It was wonderful. Had uh, incredible feedback from last week, so that's brilliant. So today we're going to talk about the gift of tongues, and we're going to talk a little bit about how the gift of tongues works in our, in our lives and in, and in the, the life of the church. We're going to talk a little bit about um, how we use it within a public worship context, and then next week we're going to explore in more detail how the, the gift of interpretation works, which we'll do that in conjunction with the prophetic. So the prophetic ministry and interpretation of tongues go hand in glove. Uh, but this morning is going to be more just exploring the gift of tongues, and we'll create some space toward the end of this morning for us to potentially receive the gift of tongues for those of you who want that gift, who have been praying for it, um, and then we'll see what the Lord wants to do in our midst. So why tongues? It's a question that you may be asking. Of all the gifts of the Spirit that we could be exploring during this series, why are we looking at the gift of tongues in particular, why this particular gift? It's one of the dynamic gifts that Jess spoke about last week, uh, along with the prophetic and gifts of healing and miracles. Um, however, tongues, for whatever reason, is seen as one of the most controversial and is often misused and has been abused in the church. Um, and therefore, it's been quite divisive throughout church history. Um, I've certainly witnessed this and I approach this topic with some fear and trembling because it seems like every time I speak on tongues or every time I use tongues within a context of a worship service, people leave the church. That's been my track record. Uh, so I just please beg you, don't leave the church if today upsets you. Uh, I would love to chat with you or with, I'm sure one of the other leaders would be happy to chat with you. Um, but we are gonna try and ground this as much as we can in scripture so that it's not just my opinion, but we're actually really reflecting and, and engaging with scripture around this together this morning. And I think it's a real shame that tongues has become such a controversial or divisive gift because it is in fact one of the most helpful gifts that the Spirit gives, particularly in terms of your own growth uh, and life as a disciple, as a follower of Jesus. It was given to help you, it was given to strengthen you, it's given to build up your faith, to build up your life in Jesus. That's what the gift is for. Uh, now, Jess was mentioning last week that she grew up in an Anglican church that didn't have a lot of room in it for the gifts of the Holy Spirit, particularly not the dynamic ones. But um, I also grew up in an Anglican church, but my experience was quite different. I grew up in a charismatic Anglican church. Um, now, when you hear the word charismatic, I want you just to put aside what you may understand by that term, because my experience of the charismatic within an Anglican context was very orderly, uh, and very structured. So we used the prayer book. We went through the, the Book of Common Prayer each week. Uh, we celebrated communion, we sang hymns, we recited the liturgy and all the prayers and, and et cetera, the, the creeds as well. 
But within the context of our service, we structured in moments where we would pray in tongues or where there would be the prophetic or where there would be interpretation or prayers for healing. That was actually built into the liturgy so that we weren't kind of whooping each other up and getting all excited. We would just say, now we're gonna pray in tongues and lots of people would pray in tongues. Not everybody, because not everyone could, but it was built in, structured into the service. And so I experienced this um, in a very orderly, structured way, in a way that really only the Anglicans can do. Um, and that had a, a huge influence on me. It's why I kind of felt some strange cognitive dissonance when I experienced Pentecostal charismatic churches later on in life. And I, and I sort of had this, this experience where, you know, we, we all had to get really excited before the Holy Spirit would move. Whereas my experience was, well, okay, we were just now gonna pray in tongues. It was just built into the liturgy. Um, so that was my experience. Um, and you know, the Holy Spirit is the gift that God has given to the whole church, not just to the charismatic branch of the church. I hope you understand that. The gift of the Holy Spirit is for the whole church, not just the charismatics or the Pentecostals. There's a famous Pentecostal conference in Sweden that happened a number of years ago that was celebrating the 100th anniversary of the Azusa Street Revivals, which is what kicked off the kind of modern Pentecostal movement in Los Angeles in 1906. And a visiting American speaker was praying and thanking God for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit that happened uh, through the Pentecostal movement that began in 1906. And when he had finished praying, um, his Swedish host stood up and thanked his American friend and in a kind of tongue-in-cheek way went on to say, you know, with all due respect, the Pentecostal movement began in Jerusalem when the Holy Spirit was poured out on the whole church, not in Los Angeles in 1906. Uh, and so that is true. Whatever tradition you come from, regardless of wh whether you're Catholic or Anglican or Assemblies of God or even Church of Christ, we are all Pentecostal Christians. Can we just say that? We are all Pentecostal Christians. We have all received the gift of the Holy Spirit that was poured out on the day of Pentecost. That is at the birthright for all Christians. And so I, I deeply believe that. And the main reason that we're doing this series, however, is because as Linda said in our first week, we want to be a word and spirit church. Uh, we wanna be a church that values deeply uh, and is built upon the word of God. But we also wanna be a church that takes what scripture teaches seriously. And if we're doing that, then we cannot ignore the teaching uh, of the work and the ministry and the gifts of the Holy Spirit. They're very clearly taught in the scriptures. And so as a church who values the scriptures, who believes the scriptures and wants to be built upon the word of God, we also want to be open to all that the Holy Spirit wants to bring into the life of the church. Can I get an amen to that? So we want to be faithful to scripture, which means being open to the work of the Holy Spirit. And speaking in tongues, which Paul sometimes calls a heavenly or angelic language, a language inspired by the Holy Spirit, or sometimes he just refers to it as praying in the Spirit, is a biblical promise, is taught in the Scriptures. And unlike most of the other gifts, in fact, there is a substantial amount of teaching on the gift of tongues in the New Testament, more than any of the other gifts. Paul really narrows in on, on tongues and the prophetic in particular, and teaches on those two more than any of the other gifts. Most of the other gifts aren't explained at all, in fact. Um, they're sort of left for you to explore as you walk in the Holy Spirit. But these two he explains in quite a bit of detail. And I think the reason for that is because he knows that they're going to be controversial. In fact, he doesn't just know it. He's seeing it happen in Corinth. Things are happening around the gift of tongues and the prophetic that are not good. And so he writes at some length about how we're to deal with these two particular gifts in a way that will be um, most beneficial and healthy for the local church. And so that's what we're dealing with today. That's what we're exploring today. 1 Corinthians 14, in verse 18, Paul says, I thank God that I speak in tongues more than any of you. <laughs> I thank God that I speak in tongues more than any of you. And although um, he also then goes on to say that despite this, within the context of public worship, Prophecy, in fact, is far more helpful uh, because it is something that the whole church can understand. Paul clearly finds tongues imen immensely beneficial in, in terms of his own private prayer life, and he uses the gift frequently. As he says, I use it all the time. I pray that you'd use it as much as I do. Um, so obviously he loves the gift, values the gift, 
uh, and it's been so helpful to him. And he goes on to say, I desire that everyone would speak in tongues. Now, he's not saying that everyone necessarily will, but that's what he'd love to see happen. He'd love to see everyone in the church speaking in tongues. Why? Because it is so helpful to us in terms of our spiritual life. It's such an important and helpful gift in terms of building us up in the faith. Now, either he means this, friends, either he means this, or he's just speaking hyperbole. Either he really means that he would like everyone in the church to speak in tongues, or he's just being, um, he's just exaggerating. I don't think he's exaggerating. I think he really would like this. That's, again, not to say that everyone will, um, but that that would be amazing. So Paul clearly loved the gift of tongues. It's very clear in 1 Corinthians 14 that it's of immense value to him. Um, it's a precious gift. It helps us, as I said, for building up our faith, but it also helps us with worship. It helps us when we pray, um, and it encourages us, I think, to trust God for other gifts as well. So when you've experienced the gift of tongues, one of the things that it does in you is inspires you for more. You want to see more of the Holy Spirit. If God can do this, then surely there's so much more that he can do in and through my life. So he says, I desire that everyone would speak in tongues because it's such a helpful gift. Now the context of this passage is Paul speaking about um, how tongues is to be used within the context of public worship. So he's not speaking here about how we use tongues privately. The, co the, the context of 1 Corinthians 14 is how tongues is to be used within a setting like this or in a home group. When you're with other believers and you want to express this gift, what's the correct way of going about it? So Paul is correcting some confusion about tongues and the prophetic uh, and addressing the misuse of this gift within the context of public worship. Because what we, although he doesn't clearly say it, what's, what comes through as you read 1 Corinthians 14, and I hope this came through to you as well, that it seems as if what's been happening in the Corinthian church is that people have gotten so excited about this gift of tongues that they've been preaching whole messages in tongues. So someone like me has stood up and spoken in front of all of you for like 20 minutes, half an hour in tongues, given a whole message in tongues. That has been of no help to anyone unless they know how to interpret what they're hearing. So you've just wasted essentially a whole bunch of time. Someone has spoken tongues in public, it hasn't been interpreted, and therefore it's not edifying to anyone within the community. It may look impressive, might make you feel good as the speaker, look how spiritual I am, I can speak in tongues, yay for me, but no one else is being edified, no one else is being strengthened, no one else is being built up. That's the issue that he's dealing with here. They thought they were being spiritual, but actually they're just being stupid. And what Paul says instead, it's better that you speak five intelligible words than 10,000 words in tongues, if no one can interpret what is being said. So it's better that you speak in a way that's intelligible for everyone to understand and engage with, rather than just show off using this gift. And uh, it's, 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 a weir it's weird. Essentially, you shouldn't do this, it's weird. No one is being strengthened, no one is being encouraged. So Paul's giving instruction then on the right use of tongues, and as a word and spirit church, um, we believe tongues is biblical, but here we have in scripture an example of a church that has gone way too far over to the spirit side. There's a lot of spirit stuff going on, but not so much word stuff going on. And so, as I said, it's not edifying the church and it's not helpful. Now, this isn't exclusive to tongues, of course. The prophetic can be misused, the prophetic can be abused. I've experienced that in my own life with people trying to manipulate me with a prophetic word. Uh, you may have experienced something like that as well. Any of these gifts can be misused or abused, which is why Paul says at the end of 1 Corinthians 14, the spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet. In other words, God may have given you a prophetic word, and we'll talk about this more next week, or God may have given you a word in tongues, but it's up to you to decide as the prophet, as the speaker, how you're going to bring that gift into the life of the church. You can do it in a way that's abusive or controlling or manipulative, or you can do it in a way that's humble and loving and intended to bless. Any of these gifts can be misused or abused. It's up to us as uh, those given these gifts and called to use these gifts faithfully to make sure that we're offering these gifts in a spirit of humility and love, not in a spirit of control or manipulation. 
And so even if a prophetic word may come to you, someone may come to you and say, I've got a prophetic word for you, or I have a word in tongues, then we're gonna get someone else to come alongside and interpret. Um, even if what they're giving to you is right, it can still be delivered in a way that is manipulative, right? An example, I'm, getting, I'm jumping into next week, but an example of this is, let's just say, uh, someone comes and gives you a word, and it is correct, but you can give them the word in such a way that you expect a certain kind of response. And that is not the place of the prophet to decide how that person receiving the word should respond. That's up to them and God. So as, a, as if someone giving a prophetic word or giving a word in tongues, I offer it and then I let it go. It's not up to me to decide how that word should be responded to. That's up to the person and with, between them and the Lord. Now, I can also make sure that when I give the word, I can do it in such a way as I can say, look, I think this might be from the Lord. I think this might be from the Holy Spirit. I don't demand that they accept it as a word from God, but I offer it to them in love and I let them carry that then before the Lord. Um, so in that sense, what we've got in 1 Corinthians 14 is the gifts being misused in all kinds of different ways. And in particular, what Paul's dealing with here is how tongues is being misused. But he also deals with the role of the prophetic as well, which we'll talk about next week. Again, not everyone will speak in tongues. It's not the mark of being a Christian, as some churches teach, or even the mark really of being filled with the Holy Spirit. Some of you may have encountered this teaching before that you're not really filled with the Holy Spirit or you're maybe not even really a Christian unless you speak in tongues. And I reject that view entirely. I don't believe that that is what the scriptures teach in any way. Um, and also you need to understand that this idea that speaking in tongues is one of the signs of being filled with the Holy Spirit itself emerged from the Azusa Street Revivals in 1906. And the context of that was racism. So many of the early 20th century American Pentecostal churches were multiracial churches at a time when it was not acceptable to be multiracial churches. And so they taught that because we're all speaking in tongues, it's a sign therefore that we're all filled with the same Holy Spirit. So then we're all part of the same family. There was an emphasis on tongues as a sign that we are unified together in the Holy Spirit. And that was really important for the early Pentecostal movement, which was pushing against racism. And White and black Americans were leading and serving alongside each other at a time when that was not permitted. And so tongues became a really important sign of our unity together as the family of God. But we've kind of moved on from that. It was something that the Holy Spirit was doing at that time in a particular way, but I still don't think that therefore means that you are not filled with the Spirit unless you speak in tongues. I don't think that's what Scripture teaches. I think we are filled with the Holy Spirit when we're born again, and we can keep on being filled with the Holy Spirit, and being open to the gifts of the Holy Spirit is one part of our journey as we grow in the life and power of the Holy Spirit. So as we teach on the Alpha Course, there's no first-class Christians who speak in tongues, and no second-class Christians who don't. We are all one in Christ Jesus. We're all born again of the same Spirit, and the Spirit distributes the gifts as He desires. But Paul also teaches that we can desire the gifts, we can ask for them. We're allowed to say, Lord, I'd really love that gift. I'd really, I really want to pray in tongues, or I really want to have a prophetic ministry, or I would really love to be uh, you know, filled with a gift of hospitality, whatever it may be. You can ask for those gifts. However, speaking in tongues is, in my experience, something that often does accompany being filled with the Holy Spirit. It's often one of the first gifts that new Christians will experience because it is intended to encourage you and build you up. And so often when people are first prayed for to be filled with the Holy Spirit, sometimes there is, often there is an outflowing of that gift because the Lord wants to tell this new person who's come, become a new creation in Christ that the Holy Spirit is real and alive and look at what he can do. And so this gift is uh, very often accompanied being prayed for to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Not always, but often. Regardless of your experience, since we don't be build our, our theology on our experience, the one thing I think we can all affirm together, I hope, is that tongues is a good gift from a good father. The gift of tongues is a good gift from a good father. 
all of God gives, God's gifts are good things, tongues included. Um, we should not treat with disdain what God has ordained. And that is why Paul concludes his teaching in 1 Corinthians 14 by saying, do not forbid speaking in tongues. Like, I'm correcting some issues here, but I don't want you to go to the other extreme and forbid the use of the gift of tongues. We need to correct its use, but we are not to forbid it. It is a gift of the Holy Spirit and we should welcome it and celebrate it. It is a good gift from a good father. Jess said last week that I love to quote Luke 11, I absolutely do. How much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? So you can ask for the gifts of the Holy Spirit, any of them, any or all of them. It doesn't matter. The Holy Spirit will work in you as he wants to. Our task is to be open and humble and willing to receive and also desiring of these things. So yes, we can ask and we'll receive, we can seek and we will find, we can knock and the door will be open to us. How much more will the Holy Spirit be poured out on those who ask him? That's what Jesus teaches. And I believe that Jesus' teaching is correct. And so I believe if you ask, the Holy Spirit will be poured out upon you. Yes, you can get to heaven without speaking in tongues, but I can't imagine why you'd want to. If you desire to speak in tongues, then don't be afraid to ask for it. What are you afraid of? What's there to be afraid of? Let the Holy Spirit be at work in your life. Um, maybe you've seen tongues used badly. Maybe it's been used in a way that just makes you feel weird and awkward. It doesn't have to be that way. And as a church, we want to be open to what the Spirit wants to do and be willing to follow the Spirit's lead. We were singing this earlier, right? If you're not in it, we don't want it. The flip side of that is, Holy Spirit, if you're in it, then we want to go in all the way. You with me? If, if this is what the Spirit wants to do in your life, then go for it. Don't be afraid. I think we often get this idea that we have to be somehow better than we really are or clean up our act or live a particularly righteous life and then God will hear us, then God will answer us. No, that's not how it works. Jesus didn't say in Luke 11, if you're good enough, the Holy Spirit will be poured out on those who ask. He just said, if you're a child of God, then ask and you will receive. How much more will the Holy Spirit be poured out on those who ask, not those who are perfect, not those who are good enough, just those who ask. So are you willing to ask this morning? Are you willing to seek? Are you willing to knock? What are we afraid of? What is tongues? Tongues is a new language of love from the Holy Spirit that strengthens us, that helps us in our prayer, in our worship, in our praise, in our intercession, and also in our lament. Also in our lament. Let me just go through these quickly. First of all, tongues is a love language. Tongues is mostly about love, friends. It's not about being better than anyone else. It's about love. In fact, the whole of this teaching in 1 Corinthians 14 is based in Paul's teaching around 1 Corinthians 13, which is the great love chapter. Like what Paul is trying to do is get these Corinthians not to um, focus on the gifts or get enamored with the gifts, but get enamored with love. Be be focused on the love of God and let the love of God lead them, not whether or not they're better than or more powerful or more spiritual than one another. So the context is 1 Corinthians 13, where Paul says, um, if I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but have not love, I'm nothing, right? So tongues without love is nothing, it's just showing off. Tongues with any of the gifts of the Spirit without love are nothing. It's about love, friends. Follow the way of love and eagerly desire the gifts of the Spirit, 1 Corinthians 14. So everything about tongues is taught within the context of love. And so therefore, I read that as a way of saying that God has given us this gift primarily to help us grow in love uh, and to build up our faith and that that's its main purpose. How does it help us? It helps us in prayer. Paul says, 1 Corinthians 14, 2, for if you have the ability to speak in tongues, you'll be talking only to God since people won't be able to understand you. Now, he's talking about that as in terms of correcting an abuse within the local church, but the good news about this verse is that if you're speaking in tongues, who are you speaking to? You're speaking to God. You get to speak to God when you pray in tongues, and that's awesome, and I think we should all desire to do this. So we're not 
just talking to God, we get to talk to God in a language that is designed to help us grow in love. So it's a private language we share with the Lord. It's also for worship. 1 Corinthians 14, 15, what then shall I do? I will pray in the spirit, I will also pray in words I understand. So it's not either or, it's both and. But I will sing in the spirit, and I'll also sing in words I understand. So tongues can be used within the context of worship. And I love that part of it. I sing in tongues all the time. It's one of the ways, probably the main way these days, that I speak in tongues. I, I don't often just sit down and pray in tongues at home on my own. I used to do it a lot, but not so much these days. I'm not sure why. Maybe I should do it more often. I always pray in tongues before I preach, though. Um, every Sunday, before I come up here, I just pray for a few moments in tongues, just, to, just asking, really, that the Lord would tune my spirit to his spirit which is what's happening when you're praying in tongues. You're kind of speaking spirit to spirit with the Lord. Um, but I love to sing in tongues. It's one of the most beautiful things that you can do. You can just stop thinking about the words and just express your spirit, express your heart, and enjoy being with the Lord. Enjoy that moment of just worshiping without needing to worry too much about whether what you're saying is in particularly theologically correct. I can just hand that over to the Holy Spirit, and that's all good. And so tongues within the context of worship is, and we'll talk about this a bit more toward the end today, um, is something that's quite clearly a part of the life of the early church as well. Um, it's for praise. In Acts 2, on the day of Pentecost, the crowd says, these people are all from Galilee, and yet we all hear them speaking in our own language about the wonderful things that God has done. So obviously in this moment, tongues is not a heavenly tongue, but earthly tongues, human languages. But these Galileans, these early followers of Jesus on the day of Pentecost are filled with the Spirit and they're saying things that they don't understand and yet the crowd around them are hearing them praise God, give thanks to God for what He's done. So in this moment, by using words that aren't coming to them naturally, but supernaturally, God is being praised. So it's a language that helps us to praise and to thanksgiving, uh, and to give thanks. Tongues is also for intercession, for praying for others. Romans 8, 26, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us in accordance with the will of God. There have been plenty of times in my life as a pastor and as a leader where I've come in contact with situations that I just have no words for where I'm asked to pray for something that I just have no idea how to pray for. Do you, know, do you know what I'm talking about? You ever been in those moments when you've thought, I don't know what to say. I don't know even how to pray. This is, there's, you know, it might be a situation of great tragedy or grief. How do I find the words to express what I'm feeling and what I've encountered here? And I found tongues extremely helpful for me in those situations because Paul tells us in Romans 8 that the Spirit is interceding within us with these, um, uh, with these prayers that are in accordance with the will of God. So again, I don't have to worry about getting the words right. I can trust that the Holy Spirit will pray through me in a way that is in accordance with God's will. He also says that we can use this gift within the context of lament. When we are sad, when we're grieving, when we're hurting, when life has gone sideways and you don't know how to pray. Romans 8 tells us that we know the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth. Like life is hard. And we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit, we groan inwardly. Does anyone know what Paul means? You ever been in a situation in life where you just don't have the words, you just groan inwardly? Even more amazingly, the Spirit himself intercedes for us through groans too deep for words. And I've, I, I think this is something that, re whether you speak in tongues or not, you can enter into. I don't think this is exclusive to speaking in tongues, but certainly I've experienced moments when I have prayed in tongues where it's taken on this deep groaning character, where I felt like there's a sadness, a grief, a pain being expressed as I've prayed in the Spirit. And it's a particularly sacred moment and I can think of a few occasions when I've been in moments of grief where I've not had the words and I've prayed in the spirit and it has taken on this deep groaning, this lament. And it's actually been so healing because I've been able to work out in those moments with the Holy Spirit 
deep grief that I feel, maybe even frustration with God, uh, pain, questions that I have that I don't have answers for. I've been able to just enter into the life of the Spirit and pray and let him groan through me. And that has brought me so much healing. And I would love for everyone to experience that, when, particularly in times when you're experiencing powerful emotions that are too hard to express with human words. Paul says, when my spirit prays, my mind is unfruitful, that doesn't mean that nothing is happening. Um, even if we're praying in the spirit and our minds aren't necessarily comprehending what is being said, there is something very powerful, very deep going on in our spirits. We are being taught things in the spirit that are hard to put into words. Tongues is a way of prayer that teaches us how to love the Lord and how to experience communication with him heart to heart, spirit to spirit. And therefore, it strengthens us. Paul says, anyone who speaks in a tongue builds themselves up. It strengthens us. Or in uh, Jude 20, I don't think I've ever preached from the book of Jude, but you, beloved, building yourselves up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit. It's a way of strengthening us, building us up, encouraging us in our hearts. And it's particularly helpful, I've found, during times of spiritual warfare, when I felt like I'm under attack. I can pray in the Spirit, I can pray in tongues, and I can go to war against the things that the enemy's trying to do in my life, but let the Holy Spirit do the fighting. It's amazing. I love that particular aspect of it. So when I'm feeling hard pressed by the enemy, I can pray in tongues and I can let the Holy Spirit fight the battle for me and I just have to stand my ground and pray. I found that very helpful throughout my life. So it's there to strengthen us. Okay, so it's, that's in terms of tongues as a kind of vertical direction, as a private experience between me and the Lord. Uh, there are some of the elements of the gift of tongues and how it works in our lives as believers. But there's also a kind of horizontal direction to the gift of tongues, which is when it's used in public. Uh, and again, we're gonna talk about this more next week. But Paul does say uh, in 1 Corinthians 14, I thank God that I speak in tongues more than any of you, but in a church meeting, I would rather speak five intelligible words or understandable words to help others than 10,000 words in an unknown language. So what he's saying is, generally speaking, tongues is not all that helpful within a public context, unless it is interpreted, and then it becomes extremely helpful. So he's not saying either or, it's prophecy's better than tongues. What he's saying is that prophecy is better than tongues if there's no one available to interpret when a tongue is spoken publicly, as in to stand up and actually give a message in tongues, okay? So we're not, he's not denigrating the gift of tongues, he's just saying it needs to be structured in a particular way to enable it to be helpful within a public meeting, within a public context. So, Paul goes on to say, I wish that you could all speak in tongues, but even more I wish that you could prophesy, for prophecy is greater than speaking in tongues, again, unless someone interprets what you are saying so that the whole church can be strengthened. So tongues can be used prophetically or horizontally to give a message from the Lord, which then needs to be interpreted so that it can be edifying to you. Um, that's the proper use of tongues in this context where I would stand and give a message. Now that doesn't mean though, that I can't use tongues within a public worship context uh, in order to enhance my worship or to enhance my prayer. Of course you can. Paul's not prohibiting the use of tongues within a public context. He's just saying you can't stand up and give a message in tongues without an interpreter. But you yourself, within the context of worship or at a moment of prayer, you can pray in tongues. And I do in church on a Sunday all the time. I just try to do it in a way that is mindful of those around me. I don't try to take over the space so that all those around me can hear as me praying in tongues. I do it in a way that is respectful of those around me try not to be too loud, I try to match the volume of the music if I can so that it's really an experience for me to enjoy with the Lord within this moment without uh, disrupting anyone else. And so if it's a quiet moment in church, you might pray quietly in tongues under my breath. When we're singing together loudly, I'll sing out in tongues 
loudly and that's just totally fine. And sorry if you've been around me on a Sunday morning and I've really bothered you and you felt um, too shy to tell me. So corporate use of tongues is something that the early church engaged in together as prayer and worship and that was without interpretation. We see this all the way through the New Testament. So for example, um, where are we here? Oh, maybe I don't have these. Here we go. 1 Corinthians 14, 15. I'll sing with my mind or my understanding, but I also sing with my spirit. Or Ephesians 5. Be filled with the spirit, speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord. Right? Or Colossians 3. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. And be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. So what I'm saying here is that within the context of the local church, as we read in Scripture, is that there are a number of different ways in which tongues was used within the context of public gathered worship. So we've talked about someone giving a message in tongues. But it's quite clear from the New Testament and as you read through the book of Acts, that the church often just sang together in tongues or sang together in the spirit. And now, you don't actually have to speak in tongues in order to do this. You don't, it, it's helpful, but it, it's not necessary. We can all follow the lead of the Holy Spirit in a moment where we're just singing from our hearts. And it, it appears that what's happening in this moment is the church is just letting the Holy Spirit lead them in a moment of worship. Um, now, Paul is clear that these moments need to be led. You do everything in an orderly way. So it's not chaos. And in fact, some of the most beautiful times in worship that I've experienced have been when the church has just paused from singing a song that's been scripted and has just let the Holy Spirit sing through them uh, in an unscripted way, in a moment of kind of open-hearted love for the Father. So we're gonna do that together in just a moment. What I wanna talk about really quick and I'm gonna invite the band to come on up right now, actually, is how do we receive the gift of tongues? A lot of folks think that it just happens. You ask for the Holy Spirit to give you the gift, and it just happens, kind of supernaturally, without your involvement. It almost never happens that way. Um, most of the people who I've experienced receive the gift of tongues have had to do something as an act of faith in order to receive it. Um, they haven't just opened their mouth and then let the Holy Spirit take over. They've actually had to start to pray. They've had to start to use their mouth, to use some words, and then let the Holy Spirit take those and shape them. And so it actually teaches us something really important about all the gifts of the Spirit, is that the Spirit never works in a way where he just takes you over and uses you without your involvement. All the gifts of the Spirit are an active partnership. And so with the prophetic, if you have a prophetic gift, you can decide when to prophesy or not, right? If you have a gift of hospitality, you can decide when to be hospitable or not. If you have a gift of healing, and this is one we don't see all that often in the life of the church and something we should pray about. But from my experience, those who have a real gift of healing from the Holy Spirit can pray and the Lord will heal. Uh, maybe not in every case, but often. The point is, the Holy Spirit doesn't just use you as a vessel and take you over and work through you without your involvement. Every gift of the Holy Spirit requires your involvement, which is why Paul says, the spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet. You can put yourself in a position where the gift can be used. It's the same with tongues. I've received the gift of tongues, I can pray in tongues whenever I want. I can turn it off whenever I want. I can turn it on whenever I want. I just begin to pray. And in terms of receiving the gift, it's the same thing. It requires a step of faith. You are involved. And so, although this seems very weird and a lot of people get kind of freaked out a little bit by it, if you, if you desire the gift of tongues and you've been praying for it and nothing has happened yet, one of the things that you will find most helpful um, if this has been a struggle for you is just begin to say some words that will 
put you in a position where you need to be like a little child before your father. Didn't Jesus say, unless you become like a little child, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. The gifts of the spirit function in exactly the same way. We start with baby steps and with tongues, you start with baby language. You begin to say just a few simple phrases um, as if you're learning a language and the Holy Spirit will begin to work through you and will take your words and begin to shape meaning. And one of the most amazing things I've discovered over the years, the more I've prayed in tongues, like any other language, the more I have learned a deeper and broader vocabulary. So when I first began to pray in tongues, it was just a few simple words. That's all I had. Over the years as I've used it, it has grown in richness and diversity and complexity, like any other language. I have to use it in order to develop it. But it took a step of faith. So I felt when I first received the gift of tongues, happened out of an experience I had with the Holy Spirit that was quite powerful and quite personal. And I came out of that knowing that I had this something in my mouth that I needed to say, and I just began to say it. And it was just something really simple, like la, 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 something like that. As I began to say those words, and I remember standing and looking at myself in the mirror doing it because I wanted to remember the moment. And I also, which was really weird, by the way, standing there looking at myself praying in tongues. But I'd heard someone, a wise teacher, tell me, if you begin to start praying in tongues, do that because it kind of, it will, it will, it will solidify the moment for you. So I did, and I began to pray in tongues with the few little words that I had. And over time, it's, be, it's grown richer and deeper. And I found that at times it takes on quite a strong and powerful and aggressive edge almost, particularly in times when I'm in warfare. Other times it's quite gentle and um, it feels like breath. So there's a dynamic to it, which we sort of just learn as we use it. But what I'm telling you this morning is you won't begin to pray in tongues unless you involve your own mouth and begin to speak. 